Hello everyone, it is time for another tier list video. It has been a bit, but it is pretty obvious what we are tier listing, because I have, very recently, finally finished Children of Earth and Sky, which was the last book I had to read by Mr. Guy Gavril Kay, who I have been raving about for like the last year, somewhat sporadically. And we got two Guy Gavril Kay videos to do. We got the tier list and where to start, and I'm doing the tier list first, well... I'd love to claim that it's because I want people to be able to watch the where to start and then if they're not sure, watch the tier list and maybe if this like me talking about them will make them more sure. Really, it's just because it's easier and I felt like doing it now. And I have this tier list. I, as you know for tier lists, I rank books against each other in tier lists. So I think by definition, any tier list I do has to have something in the bottom tier and something in the top tier. I have therefore named these... Uh, I haven't gone with the normal, like, S, A, B, C, D, which normally I think actually works pretty well, but I've just kind of named these to say what that happens to coincide for, for this author, who uh, I, I don't dislike any of the books. I think they're all at least pretty good, I guess. And I have these in publication order. For previous tier lists, I've had, like, a format where I went through spoiler-free, and then I went through in spoilers, but that's because they were big series, like, it was the, the entire first Law World, and Realm of the Elderlings, because these are all standalones. Well, they're basically all standalones. I'm just gonna not do spoilers and gonna go completely spoiler free for the entire video. Let's go. Okay, coming in in the first spot, we have this as one book, but it's actually three books uh, that I have here. We have, uh, I think the front cover of this actually makes artwork together. See, all the, uh, whatever, we tried. Um, and that is the Fionavar Tapestry. This is the most overtly high fantasy thing Kay has written. It has basically no historical influences. It is basically influenced on mythology. And it is his debut stuff. So his first book, The Summer Tree, is a weird combination of sometimes being really brilliant and sometimes just having somewhat glaring flaws. Like, I think, and that, that, I would say that's true as a trilogy as a whole. Like, it has some really, really fantastic stuff in it. The way it uses mythology can be really good. It's kind of, the idea was, in going to, like, the type of things that influenced Tolkien and do it again, it actually has a lot of stuff that reminds me of the Wheel of Time lore-wise, where it has characters who are, like, based on mythology, except in this, it's more overtly. It actually, it, it also has, like, the god is, like, someone who weaves a tapestry and it has kind of an equivalent of the Edmonds Field 5. But, oh, and the then the bad guy lives under a mountain in the north, who's a dark lord, and he uses the weather to mess with people. And before you're like, oh, it's a Wheel of Time ripoff, it actually came first. So it's not a Wheel of Time ripoff, Wheel of Time fans, so leave me alone. Uh, so basically, and I'm pretty sure there's a quote somewhere where Robert Jordan really likes Guy Gavril K. But no, also Wheel of Time is not a Fiona of our tapestry ripoff because... Stealing three books and making it 14 doesn't really work. And the reason uh, a lot of the similarities come from is because they were both looking at mythological origins. Anyways, for the most part, I really enjoy this series. It does seem to be somewhat divisive. Like, it's a terrible predictor of how much you like I, Gavril K. Because it's the least similar to all these books here. Every other book on this is more similar to each other than it is to Fionavar. And I think it has some distinct flaws. The main is it's portal fantasy... And the way people react to being in a fantasy world is kind of weird. They're weirdly good at things like horseback riding when they're just University of Toronto students. They're just kind of like, there's a wizard who's like, hey, I'm a wizard. And they're just like, bullcrap. And then he just like does a bit of magic. And they're just like, oh, you're a wizard. I have no further questions. That being said, really interesting world. Some really good story. It does feel, um, I would say... Some people don't like more overtly emotionally manipulative. Like it's swinging for the fences more often than some later works. It tended to land quite a bit for me. Um, it would still be some of the weaker books, but I think Fionavar is good. Um, Fionavar is bordering on really good. I like. I think I like it more than most people. Uh, I mean, I know like Pranav, who's on Discord, who you may recognize if you're in any Discords. He agrees with me on basically all of these Guy Gavril K books, but he would put Fionavar, like, in mediocre. I... I quite like the Fionavar tapestries. Uh, I'm, I'd have it between here. Um, I'm gonna put it top of good... Uh, no, I'm putting it in really good. I don't even care. Um, we're putting it... 
I really like Fiona Var. I think it's a wonderful story. Um, and yeah, it's just, you know, it's not, it's so different from all his other works that it doesn't really make sense to start with it because it just doesn't tell you whether you'll like the rest of the Guy Gabriel K books. Uh, and next we get in publication order two, Tigana, where he started moving towards what the most of his career would be. This one is very much more fantasy than the rest. This is fantasy inspired with historical spin instead of like historical fiction with a fantasy spin. And Tigana is by far his most famous work, and it absolutely rules. Uh, Tigana, I still think, like, I think it has the strongest antagonist of any of his books. It arguably has the most rich world, maybe under heaven. Um, it the, He's really found his writing voice in this book. It does also, I think, maybe have some minor things that would move it below later books for me. Um, it's middle... It is not his best middle. Uh, he does have a tendency of having, like, really, really good starts and really, really good ends. But some books he also has really, really good middles. This, I would say, is not one of them. It's probably his most horny book like his most overtly horny um in that it's uh more detailed in the horny scenes there's a couple of really horny ones but it makes up for it by being brilliant and yeah that's about all i got for cons it's pretty fantastic it like um fiona of our stylistically like swings for the fence emotionally wise but for me it hits it uh I would say it's very interesting that the focal character, of it has a lot of point of views. He, Guy Gavroquet in general has a lot of point of views. That would actually also be one of the things I, I thought The Darkest Road, the last Fiona Var book, maybe had too many point of views for the size it was telling. But Fiona Var, what's interesting is I think the focal character who actually like is causing stuff to happen never gets a point of view. And I thought that was extremely well done. Um, and it's, it's an incredible standalone story. It also is his longest book, but it's definitely, it's up here in, um, not quite all time favorite, but among my favorite Guy Gavril K books. And it's kind of the book that all other books that he writes get graded against. Um, and next is a song for Airbone, which, uh, is what comes after Tigana. And unlike Tigana, you've good chance you've never heard of it. Uh, unless you've watched like, you know, someone's review of it. I do have a review for this up on my channel. It also absolutely rules. Uh, a Song for Airbone is moving to more towards historical, but still not quite to the same degree. So it's still like a little bit more fantasy than the previous ones. But like Tigana has sorcerers. Uh, Tigana, for those who don't know, like the premise is a guy used magic to not only to like de destroy the memory of an entire culture. The antagonist is like a really power. The two antagonists are both really powerful sorcerers. This uh, magic is much more subtle. Um, it is not quite control the lives of, of mortal men and women to the same degree. A Song for Airbone did not quite hit the highs of Tigana for me in that, like, I think the end of Tigana is better than any scene in Song for Airbone, like the last, I don't know, 20% of Tigana. But A Song for Airbone is one of his most consistently enjoyable books where it starts really good, and then it just keeps getting better. It might be the strongest middle, other than, like, Lord... It's one of the strongest middles of any Guy Gavro K book, in my opinion, and then also has a really, really strong end. Uh, the only thing I could see holding it back... it it, it Guy Gavro K, in general, at some points, the career was a little guilty of, like, people getting knocked out and then waking up and just having, like, a headache and being fine. That kind of annoyed me, but that's a nitpick. And uh, I could see people thinking the antagonist was a bit much. I think he's the only character in any of his books uh, that, like, his historical books that he actually describes as evil. Uh, dude dude sucks. But it's 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 very hard to find a flaw. It's one of the most, like, rock-solid Guy Gavril K books. It also is probably the best-paced Guy Gavril K book. Uh, it's also one of the more action-y Guy Gavril K books. It doesn't have a lot of action. None of his books are, like, super action-packed. But it's one of the more military ones where the protagonist, Blaze, is like a mercenary. A lot of uh, Kay's protagonists are not in a situation for him to write like a military book because they're not good at stabbing people. Like Crispin from the Serentine Mosaic isn't good at violence, so there's not going to be that much. Um, but this has quite a bit, and Blaze, fantastic protagonist, just really wonderful book. And next we have The Lions of Al Rasson, his second most famous Guy Gavel K book. And really the one that is the most like all of these books, except Isabel, um, The Lions of Al-Rasson is 
instead of being a fantasy with historical fiction influences, it's like near historical fiction with a little turn to the fantastic. Um, it would be top of book absolutely rules. This was my favorite non-hob book of 2021. Uh, it like Tigana, I think the this is like Lions. It's always hard for me to say whether I like some of the books more than Lions because I think Lions actually has like one of the weaker middles for Guy Gavril K at this time. I still really like the middle, but it, the last chapter, not the epilogue, but the final chapter, might still be my favorite Guy Gavril K chapter. It's brilliant, and it might be one of my favorite starts to a Guy Gavril K book. So it hits extraordinarily high highs. Uh, it can. I, some people find it less engaging than Tigana. I think it might be because there's a less clear antagonist. Um, the inspiration for this book is kind of, it's the beginning, it's before there's going to be a holy war. It's set in like uh, around the reconquering of the Iberian Peninsula and I think the 10th century. And there's going to be a holy war. Like the, the, there's, there's, this is also where he introduces like, his world that's going to be connected to a lot of these. So Sailing to Serantium, Lord of Emperors, Last Light of the Sun, Children Were from the Sky, Brightness Long Ago, All the Seas of the World, and Lions are still, are somewhat generally in the same setting across like a thousand years. And he introduces, there's like three religions dominating this near Europe, the same way there was in real life. There's the Jadites, who are basically the Christians, uh, the Asherites, who are, it, it's kind of like Islam or, um, or Muslims, and it's the Kindath, which is Judaism. Basically, not exactly, but they're clearly um, representative in some ways. Not directly, but loosely. And the Jadites are gonna be re are, are gonna be reinvading Alrazan because Alrazan is no longer the dominant force in the area that it used to be. And two and people from both sides of that, like Asherites, Jadites, and the Kindath, are going to end up in the same city. And instead of clashing, they kind of get along and interact a lot. But you also, like, they know there's going to be a holy war, and it's, I think it's done brilliantly. It's, um, it rules. It would, uh, it's going to probably be the top of this tier. It's almost all-time favorite. Okay, next. Sailing to Serantium, which is basically, and we also have Lord of Emperors, which make up the Serantine Mosaic, which I personally think should be one really large book. But it got split in two. And book one is Sailing to Serantium. It has some things that put it in the book absolutely rules tier. It has some of his best writing. It has my favorite Guy Gavril K setting. Uh, he builds a setting. It's like the Byzantine Empire in the 5th century, but turned. And uh, it's my favorite Guy Gavril K setting so far. I think the way he kind of captures the essence of that setting is just wonderful and in general i think his settings work so well because they're not just backdrops they actually affect the story and the people in the work um the reason this isn't higher is that it's largely a setup book and it doesn't really have a super impactful ending because it's basically the first half of a really large book uh, which gets me to, it also has my favorite guy, Gavril K, protagonist, Crispin, the mosaicist, this guy. It's also probably structurally one of the more difficult ones to get into. Like, each chapter, it has really large chapters. They all have pretty big chapters, but it has the largest chapters, and each is almost like its own mini-narrative. Like, you never get one chapter ends, and then you go to the next chapter from, like, the same person's point of view. I have a really long review of this series, but it might be my favorite video. So if you want to know more, watch that. I think it's a really good review. Um, and we get to Lord of Emperors, which is, I've been saying this for a while, if you are here in the future, and it is 2023, you can go watch my video, Top 10 Favorite Books I Read in 2022, you can skip to the end, and this is going to be one, because this is going to be my favorite book of the year, and this is an all-time favorite book. This is Lord of Emperors by Guy Gavril K, which is my favorite Guy Gavril K book by... A somewhat decent margin. It basically... It, oh, it's so good. He went hard. It's my favorite cast of characters in any Guy Gavril K book. He has... There's no Dramatis Persone for this book. I don't know why. He has Dramatis Personae for all of these books and all of these books. But he just doesn't have Dramatis Personae for the Serentine Mosaic and the Last Light of the Sun. Who knows? Um, it... But I didn't end up needing it because despite there being a lot of characters and POV hopping, I never forgot who anyone were because they all had such interesting stories. This is a combination of following the really important events and changes that are going to shape the next 
set like millennia and also a focus on like people's personal struggles in their lives it's brilliant it's my favorite it's probably my favorite ending to a guy gavro k book as well it's just it's wonderful it is my favorite book by one of my favorite authors and it is almost certainly going to be my favorite book of 2022 i can't say enough that's positive about Lord of Emperors. Also, I think it's my favorite guy, Gavril K. Writing. He went hard for this entire book. Oh, it's so good. Okay. Um, Last Light of the Sun. This is a book that I think is often slandered. Um, this is one of the least popular Guy Gavril K. books. Most people seem to have it in their bottom tier for Guy Gavril K. And I really do not get it. I think this book rules. Um, I don't even know why it wouldn't rule. It was excellent. It actually has some of my favorite Guy Gavrilke's use of the supernatural. It's kind of set in um, in England in the Viking era with Alfred the Great. And it has kind of, you know, the haunted forest type thing going on. And the, the way, like, the supernatural stuff and atmosphere is written is, I think, completely brilliant. Um, yeah, I, I don't really... And I think... It has a strong start, middle, and end. Like, I think it's well-paced. It has a really strong cast of characters. The writing's amazing. Um, I guess the setting probably feels less fresh than some of the others because we've seen England so much, so I can kind of see that. But I don't know. Whatever. I thought it was brilliant. I think it absolutely rules. I I might even put it here. I don't know. Um, these two are pretty close. I think Sailing to Sorrentium has the better setting and protagonist, but Last Light of the Sun has a lot more payoff. I definitely wouldn't put it above our bone. As good as I think this is, I think these do have slightly better moments, but i putting it in the same tier. <clears throat> okay. Isabel. This is a follow-up to the Fiona of our tapestry, but while the Fiona of our tapestry is mostly set in a fantasy world, this is mostly set in our world. It's pretty good. Um, this this was weird to read. I, I, I wonder if... This is weird to read because I'm so used to Guy Gavril K writing with, like, the voice of people in the past. And he, his writing style is much more modern to fit, like, a modern protagonist. Like, the protagonist is just a kid from modern day. It also is, um, it's basically a YA book, and I'm not using that as an insult the way some people do. I'm not being like, the writing is worse, so it's YA. I mean, like, the themes of the book is, like, someone who is 14 beginning, starting to be, be treated more like an adult. So, um... I would basically say this book has two parts. It's got a 2,000-year grudge match between two people who keep dying and fighting over and over again, and it's got a photography trip. And I would have liked a lot more about the grudge match and a lot less about the photography trip. Because that being said, it's still had excellent stuff. It was still good. I enjoyed it. It had some good side characters as well, but it just it, it wasn't particularly engaging to me. Um, okay, next. Under Heaven by Guy Gavril K., which is his first move into a, like, setting based on China. And uh, I think this is the Tang Dynasty. It's like 8th century China. And this book absolutely rules. It's fantastic. It is, uh, I think, comparing it with Al Rasson, I like Al Rasson slightly more. I think Al Rasson had slightly higher highs for me. But Under Heaven is harder to find any criticism for. I also, I have a review for, by the way, this book, this book, this book, this book, this book, um, on my channel. I recorded a review for the Fiona of Our Tapestry and then the sound got corrupted and I got mad and never recorded it again. Um, but Under Heaven, very hard to find critique for. One of the most unique starts to a novel, maybe his best world building as well. Some of his best, like, side characters, not like secondary characters, but like almost one-off characters that I've seen in a novel. Um, yeah, wonderful story. Love this. Next up, River of Stars, uh, which I know we'll, we'll have a comment from um, from a certain guy, Gavril K fan, who uh, likes River of Stars way more than Under Heaven. I don't. I think River of Stars is really good, though. Um, I thought River of Stars was excellent. River of Stars is the follow-up. Now, these are both standalones, but you should read Under Heaven before River of Stars. River of Stars takes place like 400 years after Under Heaven. So it's not like if you read Under Heaven, like River of Stars could have never come out and Under Heaven would have told the complete story. But also my favorite scene in River of Stars doesn't really work if you haven't read Under Heaven. So uh, definitely read Under Heaven first. Also, I like it more. Uh, but River of Stars, it actually my, has one. I love the first chapter of River of Stars and I love the last chapter of River of Stars. And I love a bunch of chapters in between. I did. This was one of the every Guy Gavril K book up here. 
I read and I came away with the feeling like, holy crap, every single character is well fleshed out. Like, you have to go down to people who basically just don't have a line of dialogue before you get people who are not well fleshed enough to who don't have their own interesting story going on. River of Stars did, is one of the books that unfortunately did not give me that feeling. That being said, I thought the protagonist and the main cast of characters was still fantastic, and it had a fantastic ending, really good writing, and it covered a lot of ground. Like, a lot happens in this book. So it's still really good, but uh, I just, I felt the characters, like, didn't have as deep of a bullpen as the ones above it. And also, Guy Gavroke is a fan of having some omniscient narration. This is where he started stepping up the amount of omniscient narration. Um, where And there's a couple books where I felt it got a little bit repetitive. Where the narrator will narrate something. And I don't have any problem. All of them in isolation are really good. But they at times felt like they were just covering similar ground. This is kind of, this is going to come up again in a couple books. So I still think this book is excellent. But it had some flaws in my opinion. Okay. Next up, Children of Earth and Sky, the last Guy Gavril K book I read that is based in Croatia, and this is also going to be a really good book. This was one of the quieter Guy Gavril K books um, that, unfortunately, so I haven't been mentioning that much, but there's a varying degree of horny in Guy Gavril K books. And uh, early in his career, there's a weird tendency where, like, all the really horny books also have, other than the horny stuff, the best stuff. This is the only Guy Gavril K book that I think is both really horny and also not a masterpiece, which is kind of unfortunate. But it still was extremely enjoyable. It had some really interesting stories. Um, the the display, like the writing of art, Guy Gavril K really likes having artist characters. Uh, like he's got a mosaicist here. He's got poets in Our Song. He's also got poets in Under Heaven. He's got music and singers here. He's got different kind of music here. Um, what was it in The Last Light of the Sun? I actually forget. That's kind of bad. Um, and then Children of Earth and Sky, he has a painter protagonist. And the way he does that is fantastic. It's, uh, it's, I think you should read the Serentine Mosaic before you read Children of Earth and Sky. It is set around like 1500. Um, so in the Eastern Mediterranean. So if you know what happened a little before that, you might know why the book set in the Byzantine Empire, set around the city of Serantium, which is a stand-in for Constantinople, may be a bit important for Children of Earth and Sky thematically. It doesn't actually matter, like, character plot-wise. Like, it's not like it's a spoiler to read Children of Earth and Sky work, but I think a lot of the scenes will hit harder in Children of Earth and Sky if you have read the Serentine Mosaic. So I would recommend reading the Serentine Mosaic for it. I also just think the Serentine Mosaic is better. So, yeah. Next up, we have A Brightness Long Ago, which was the second last Guy Gavril K book I read and is going into all-time favorite. Holy crap, I love this book. This uh, is set before Children of Earth and Sky. It's a prequel that was written after. I think you can read Children of Earth and Sky or A Brightness Long Ago probably in either order, but read All the Seas of the World after A Brightness Long Ago. So the reading order for those three books is weird. I'll probably explain it in my Where to Start video better. Um, this is, this book has first person Guy Gavril K. It's not all first person, but there's some first person retrospective and first person retrospective Guy Gavril K hits different. This was also, I think one of his tightest novels in terms of like where stuff, how much stuff is happening in such a short book. It's one of my favorite starts to like a book. It starts where, um, the reminiscence of a, of an older man of when he was younger and, um, Basically, an assassin came through to, to kill a leader who was, like, a monstrous person, like a horrible person. And he recognized this assassin and let them go anyways. And it's his guilt about how that caused bad things to happen to someone who worked for the leader who he actually considered a good man. It slaps. Uh, it, does, it has horse races as well, which are good. Not as good as the chariot races from Serentine Mosaic, which I didn't mention for the Serentine Mosaic. But the chariot races... I will read about a Guy Gavril K chariot race before I watch actual sports. They're amazing. I think we should bring back chariot racing back to society. Uh, this also, once again, has the impression where, like, every character is really well fleshed out. Like, everyone. It's no matter how deep you go. It's like everyone. There are characters who you literally, ex like, you expect them to be one-offs. And then by the end of the book, I'm like, holy crap, I love this dude. Um, it's fantastic stuff. 
Uh, I also think ideally you would read the Serentine Mosaic before Brightness long ago. I think there is some stuff that will just hit harder if you if you do. And definitely don't read all the Seas of the World before Brightness long ago. It will literally just spoil the crap out of it. But you can read a Brightness long ago first. And it is an all-time favorite book. I'm going to be doing a list of favorite pro standalones. And, I mean, it's, it's going to be first. Uh, I also have a review of that one. Okay. And last is All the Seas of the World, which I unfortunately read before Brightness Long Ago and Children of Earth and Sky. And since I have read those, uh, it has made me go, okay, as a book, there's some time All the Seas of the World spent on stuff that makes more sense why they spent on stuff it, after having read Children of Earth and Sky and a Brightness Long Ago. But I also think as a book that's marketed as a standalone, which yes, Guy Gavril K has said you can start with it. Um, I've had someone say otherwise, that person is just making things up. He's, he's said in multiple places, on Twitter and in his Reddit A at MA, that this is supposed to work as a standalone. It does not work as a standalone. It spoils the brightness long ago. Don't read it first. Uh, it's a good book. I I had some problems with all the seas of the world. I simply felt... I really liked the start. Actually, I really liked the first third of this book. I, I felt it kind of just ran out of gas. Um, I will say... I think that's actually true for... Early in Guy Gavril K's career, I think one thing where he has maybe stepped down a little bit is, like, the climax, like, the actual climaxes of the book. All the scenes of the world, the final act of the book was just not that impactful for me, unfortunately. Uh, it also had the same issue I had with River of Stars, where I felt some of the omniscient narration got a little bit repetitive. And it had the issue I had with River of Stars, where I just, I didn't get the impression that every character was really well fleshed out. Although that may be the case if I had read these two, which you sh absolutely should do before. Although I actually think you can read Children of Earth and Sky and All the Seas of the World in any order. Like for these three books, which are all close together, like they take place within 20 years of each other. I basically think the only thing that matters is that you read A Brightness Long Ago before you read All the Seas of the World. I think you can read Children of Earth and Sky anywhere in that point. Although I kind of think you should read Serentine Mosaic before that. So... Whatever. Anyways, this is the tier list. It is not quite a bell curve, but that's fine because most of his books absolutely rule and are all pretty close to each other. So I wasn't really expecting it to be a bell curve and I am okay with that. We got two books in the top tier and one in the bottom. And this, I think, pretty well represents how I feel about it. And I don't think I have to change anything here. I am happy with the ordering of anything, everything. These two are really close. Um, these two are really close. None of the others are mega... I mean, these are all kind of close. But anyways, that is what we got. Next up is going to be uh, pros and cons of the various places to start. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the video. If you have read Guy Gavril K, okay, let me know where you think I'm crazy and where you agree. Uh, or are you like probably most people who have read maybe one or two Guy Gavril K okay books and are wondering where to go next? Um, I think if you were to just ask me... Like, if I was given one sentence to recommend a reading order, I would say go historic, so non Fionavar books in publication order. So you can go like Tigana, Arbonne, Arasan, Serentine Mosaic, Last Light of the Sun, Under Heaven, River of Stars, Children of Sky, Brightness Long Ago, All Seas of the World. That should work. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Bye, everyone.